candidate <laughs> is uh, Floyd Bain. He's running against uh, Eric Cantor. And I think this is your yeah. second time running. Yes. Yeah. In one of the most Republican districts. But it's, uh, yeah, I'm sure you have a lot to say about this. Yes, I do. Five or ten minutes. All right, the first thing, I want you all to stand up. Stretch. Come on. Stand up. I teach school. I know what it's like to sit for 90 minutes. You want to get up, move around, get the blood circulating. Talk to the person next to you, see how they're doing. Right. Just, just don't leave. Come back. Good as you need to be. Well, you've heard from the preacher, and you've heard from two beautiful, strong women. Now you're going to hear from the bald guy. So it's, it's tough to follow this because they've said a lot of the things I normally say. I don't usually, when I go to Republican committee meetings or Tea Party meetings, I'm not usually following other speakers. So I don't want to get too redundant with this. I think one of the things we ought to stop and think about today is the name of this group. Republican Liberty Caucus. Think about that for a minute. Why do we have a Republican Liberty Caucus? Seriously, it's not, it's not rhetorical. Can anybody answer that? Why do we have a, a Republican Liberty Caucus? In the We've got enough forces of the party. Say again? We've got enough forces of the party. Yes, you are absolutely correct, sir. Give him a shrewd. All right. We stand up here. Uh, Mr. Jackson did it. Uh, my compatriots have done it. I'm going to do it too. And we talk about the evil that is Barack Obama and his administration. And rightly so. We should talk about it. But we do ourselves and we do our future a disservice if we ignore the fact that we didn't get here just because of Democrats. Okay? We're not in this mess just because Democrats love big government and they like to spend money, and they like to control every aspect of our lives. We're in this mess because far too many of our Republican brethren have done it too. They spend money like there's no tomorrow. At the same time, they're complaining about social welfare programs being unconstitutional and unsustainable. They don't have a problem with, for instance, renewing the charter for the Export-Import Bank which is nothing more than corporate welfare. Well, guess who voted for that? Eric Cantor. In fact, he worked in a bipartisan fashion with Steny Boyer to get that done. Well, let me ask you folks, when it comes to the Constitution, and I have read it, and I do understand it, are you willing to compromise on your liberties? Now, if, if Rob and I want, Robert, Kenyon and I want to discuss where we're going to go to eat after this, and he wants to go eat Italian, and I want to go eat Chinese, but we settle on Mexican. That's a compromise I'm willing to live with. <laughs> but if we're going to talk about, well, should the federal government be spending $146 million more dollars of your money to bail out businesses that can't run themselves properly, are you willing to compromise on that? Or do you want someone representing you? who's going to compromise on that. Because every time we have one of these little compromises, oh, it's only 146 million, no, it's only 5 billion, oh, it's only 55 billion, it adds up. And, and it, not only do the figures add up, but the attitude, the attitude of, well, it's, I know it's not constitutional, but it's really not that big a deal. We'll fix it later. Folks, we're in this mess because people have ignored the Constitution. Now, I've never been in the military like Karen has. I, I never swore that oath. But I can tell you this. As a man who's been married for over 30 years, who swore an oath in front of a bunch of witnesses to be faithful to his wife, I think oaths do mean something. And if you say it, you ought to mean it. And if I raise my hand and swear to uphold and defend the Constitution, you have my word that that's exactly what I'm going to do. Now, Karen spoke to, for a minute about the Republican creed. <clears throat> One of the problems I have, I, I got angry with the Republican Party years ago. You probably know in 2010 I ran as an independent. A lot of people ask me, well, why would you leave the party? I've always voted Republican. 
why, why are you doing this independent thing? And it's exactly because the party quit doing what it said it was supposed to do. And I got to the point where I felt like, well, who do I trust? Who do I believe in? If your house is broken into and somebody steals your TV, who do you call? Police. Don't you call the police to make a report? Because you trust the police. The police are going to find out who did it. They're going to get your TV back, or at the very least, we're going to prosecute the guy that stole it. Well, after the police officer's through writing the report, before he leaves, he takes your stereo with him. <laughs> well, now who do you call? You've called the person you trusted to do the right thing and help you fix this problem, and he's screwing you too. So who do you trust? Well, after the last election, I had a lot of people email me and call me and say, Floyd, we really wish you'd come back to the party. We think your best chance of beating Canners in a primary, and we'd like to support you. Because I didn't get a lot of support last time from Republicans because of that split the vote argument. I know you've all heard it. If I vote for you, the Democrat will get elected. Okay. The fact is, my campaign manager and I and some other folks sat down, we talked about it. We thought, yeah, okay, this is the best way to go about it. Because ultimately, the bottom line to all this is, we have to get rid of these people who don't seem to mind undermining the Constitution. Whether they have a D next to their name or an R next to their name is completely irrelevant to me. What is relevant is what do they vote on. And if they prove to me that they don't care a whit about the Constitution, then they need to go. And we need to start paying attention to who they are, even in our own party, and hold them accountable. Well, how do you do that, Floyd? How do you hold someone accountable? I'm going to, I heard so many people last time, well, you know, Eric Cantor's re-elected. We're going to hold his feet to the fire. We're going to make him do what he said. He's a young gun now. He's seen the error of his ways. He's got it. He gets it now. But who'd you vote for? Uh, I voted for Eric Cantor again. <laughs> Is that holding them accountable? All you're saying to that guy is, you know, I'm going to wag my finger at you, and I'm going to tell you not to do something, and if you do it again, well, you know what? I'm going to wag my finger again and tell you not to do it again. How's that fixing anything? We've got to send a message. Look at the three of us. You get the three of us from Central Virginia in Congress and think of the changes that can be made. Three liberty-conscious candidates who actually care about the Constitution. Three people who are not going to be pushed around and bullied. I've had people ask me, well, Floyd, you know, the, the party establishment is going to try to intimidate you. They're going to tell you what they expect you to do. Well, you know what? I've refereed ice hockey for 15 years. There's not a word or a name you can call me or a thing you can... I've had pucks shot at me. <laughs> You're not going to do anything to intimidate me. It's just not going to happen. So when I get to Washington, D.C., it's going to be about our agenda, not their agenda. The Republican creed says that the fiscal responsibility and budgetary restraints must be exercised at <coughs> all levels of government. That's our creed. TARP. We just talked a minute ago about Obama's stimulus plan and how he's trying to spend more government money to stimulate the economy. It's TARP by a different name. It's the same thing. Your tax dollars bailing out businesses in the private sector who don't know how to run their business. I've been a business owner. My family and I, right out of high school, I went into the family grocery business. We owned three stores at one time. So I know how to run a business. I know how to do a payroll. And I know that there are times when you have to cut expenditures to stay afloat. The only difference between my budget and the budget in Washington, D.C. is the number of zeros. It's the same principles. They try to tell us, oh, it's, it's entirely too complicated. You little peons out in flyover country can't possibly comprehend the, the subtleties of the budgetary process. Yeah, I can. It's real simple. You're spending $50 billion. You're taking in $40 billion. It don't work you got to stop doing it. PEPFAR, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Anybody remember that one under George Bush? Canada voted for it twice. $55 billion of your tax dollars going to Africa so they could fight AIDS over there. Now, 
I'm sure we all agree that AIDS is a scourge and that people should be educated about it and those who have it should be helped. Is there anything in our Constitution that you're aware of that authorizes our federal government to do that with our tax dollars? $55 billion. It's not chump change. My opponent has raised the debt ceiling eight times. The most recent one was last August. Under Barack Obama, he raised $2.1 trillion. Now, there were supposed to be $2.4 trillion in cuts to offset that. Has anybody seen them? Anybody know where they are? I've got people doing research for me. I do research on my own. I can't find them. If you can tell me where these $2.4 trillion in cuts are coming from, I would really like to know. And, of course, I just mentioned a minute ago that the uh, Export-Import Bank charter has been extended yet again. So he's shown that he doesn't have a problem with spending money as long as he gets the okay from the party hierarchy. Is that the way it's supposed to work? Did he swear an oath to the Republican Party or did he swear an oath to the Constitution? Because I'll tell you right now, it's being, you can videotape it, you can record it, whatever you want to do. When I raise my hand and swear that oath, if the Republican Party expects me to do something contrary to that oath, I'm going to tell them to go pound sand. It's not going to happen. The federal government must preserve individual liberty by observing constitutional limitations, another part of our creed. Let's go back to 2006 and H.R. 6166, the Military Commissions Act of 2006, which gave more authority to the executive branch and military tribunals regarding U.S. citizens. It's a precursor of the NDAA. Now, Congress has abdicated its responsibilities under a constitution by giving all these powers to the president and having all these czars that we don't even vote for and they're unaccountable to us. We need to restore Congress's authority under the constitution. But nobody talks about that. I've got a video on my website, and some of you have seen it, where Eric Cantor is actually arguing with Chris Matthews about who has the right to declare war. And Eric Cantor actually stands there and argues with Matthews and a Democrat congressman saying it's the president's responsibility to decide when we go to war. Really? This guy's representing me and he doesn't even understand that the Constitution says it's Congress's responsibility. We've talked about NDAA and what an abomination that is, so say goodbye to your Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment rights. You can be detained on the street. Now, people say, well, Floyd, we're, that's about terrorists and terrorism. And we don't have to worry about that. We're just regular American citizens. They're not going to come lock us up, really. Do you own a gun? Well, yeah. Uh, you retired military? Yeah. Guess what? Our Department of Homeland Security has decided that you are a potential terrorist. What an insult, especially to our military. Anybody returning from overseas from combat duty is considered a risk to be a potential terrorist. Anybody who signed that bill and voted for it should be slapped upside their head for being that stupid and that arrogant and being that insulting to our military. H.R. 347, Federal Restricted Buildings and Grounds Improvement Act of 2011. That sounds pretty innocuous, doesn't it? I mean, it's Restricted Buildings and Grounds Improvement Act. We're just looking to improve some federal grounds, that's all. We're going to plant some grass here, trim the edges. No, what it says is, if you go to protest something in Washington, D.C., how many of you here have done that? How many of us have been to Washington to protest the bill that's coming up? Whatever the reason. If the person that you are protesting is speaking, and you are out there with the sign, Obama sucks, Eric Cantor needs to go, and the Secret Service is protecting that individual at this particular event, guess what? It's a felony offense if the Secret Service decides you don't have a right to protest that day. You need to leave. We're not going to allow a protest today. No signs, no yelling, nothing. you got to go. If you're arrested, it's a felony. Not a misdemeanor, a felony. Say goodbye to your First Amendment rights. Mr. Cantor voted for this. Federal Aviation Administration Reauthorization Act, which now says that the unmanned drones that we use over in Afghanistan and Pakistan to launch missiles, 
Well, now they can fly around here and spy on us. No Fourth Amendment rights, no warrant is needed, no probable cause. If they're just flying around and they happen to videotape you doing something that's illegal, well, they can charge you and arrest you. No probable cause involved. Mr. Cantor signed that. He voted for it. CISPA, Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act. How many of you like to surf the internet? Probably do a lot of your research there, don't you? How many of you have a blog and post things that might be considered anti-government? <laughs> yeah. Well, guess what? Now the government can spy on you and see what places you're surfing, where you're going, who you're talking to. No Fourth Amendment, no warrant, no probable cause. We've heard about this blogger guy who writes things about the Constitution. We want to check him out. Eric Cannon voted for that. Peace is best preserved through a strong national defense, part of our creed. You know we've got more soldiers on the border between North and South Korea than we do on our own southern border. How does that make sense? If the primary focus of the federal government is the protection of these United States, why are we spending billions of dollars and sending our troops overseas to protect other countries and we won't even hire more agents to patrol our southern border? Do you think maybe if we weren't spending money on 130, we've got troops in 130 countries, 900 bases around the world, maybe if we brought some of them home, we could save enough money to hire a few more border agents? Just a thought, you know, something we might want to consider. When it comes to saving money, we hear people talk about our, getting our fiscal house in order often. How would we do that? We need to stop spending. Where would we cut, Floyd? What would we stop spending money on? Well, I've got 11 pages here of bureaus, agencies, departments, and bureaucracies in the federal government that are unconstitutional, and we could get rid of them. How about the Personal Income Tax Division of the IRS? I'd abolish that. Department of Education, I'd get rid of it. Department of Energy, FEMA, get rid of them. Nat you're going to love this one. National Institutes of Health, Office Minority Health, Office of Minority Health, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. That's the kind of stuff our tax dollars are being spent on. And of course the redundancy in here is just unbelievable. But we're spending billions of dollars a year supporting these bureaucracies. Folks, it's got to stop. And the only way it's going to stop is if we stop burying our heads in the sand and pretending that the only problem is the Democrats. And once we get rid of the Democrats, problem solved. We've got to look for Republicans who respect and revere the Constitution and who will support their oath to uphold that document. Otherwise, we're just spinning our wheels, nothing's going to change, and the country's going to keep circling the toilet bowl. We have got to stop. And I'm asking you to help me to help you restore the Constitution. June 12, we have a chance to make a difference. I want you to, if you decide you want to support me, and I certainly hope you will, I want you to talk to your friends, your neighbors, your family, tell them, June 12th, you got to get out and vote. No excuses. I don't care if it's raining. I don't care if it's hot. I don't care if you have to stand in line for 45 minutes. This is too important to make excuses. We talk about it every election cycle. We need to make some changes. We need to get good people in there. We need to get regular citizens back in Washington and restore some common sense. Well, now's your chance to do it. You got two great choices over here. I hope you agree that I'm a good choice. And if we get people like us up there working together, we can make some serious changes. Tammy's got a, a clipboard around here. I think we left it over here with uh, a pen. I want you to sign up if you want to help the campaign. Give me your name and any contact information, whether you like email or physical street address or phone number. If you're willing to donate, I make no bones about it. I need your help there, too. You know who I'm up against. I mean, the man all of his faults knows how to raise money. So I'm up against the big money machine. I need your help there so I can get my message out. So anything you can do to help is greatly appreciated. 
Again, June 12, I can't say that enough. You'd be amazed how many people don't know right now that there's a primary on June 12. So whenever you're talking to somebody, if they're even the least bit politically inclined or want to know what's going on in the political scene, June 12, okay? So there you have it. I'm uh, think of myself as a liberty candidate because I do believe in the Constitution. I'm just a regular guy, I'm not a lawyer, don't want to be a career politician. My family has owned a business, so I know how to run a business. Been married 30 years, two kids, and I just became a career changer, uh, became a teacher. I'm substitute teaching in Chesterfield County right now. So if I can't make a difference in Congress, I'm going to try to make a difference in the education system. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now. Yes, sir. Um, what are your positions on uh, the immigration, uh, the war on drugs, and gay marriage? Well, let's do that one at a time, shall we? Immigration, uh, I think Bonnie covered it. She covered it really well earlier in that it's illegal. I mean, if, you, if it's illegal immigration, that, that word right there says it all. You don't reward bad behavior. So this idea of you know letting them acquire citizenship over a period of time, well, there is a way of acquiring citizenship. You apply and you go through the process. Now, we could stop illegal immigration without spending billions of dollars on a fence, there's a couple of ideas I've had. One is you take away the perks. No free benefits, no free education, no free medical care, no social security benefits you haven't paid into because you get paid under the table and sending all your money back home. You take away the perks and a lot of people are going to leave on their own. Another idea I've had is we've got a National Guard in this country that does its service one week in a month and two weeks out of the year. Well, why don't we have them do that on the southern board? They're getting their training, and we're getting the benefit of them actually doing something to protect the country. Now, what the second one was uh, the war on drugs. War on drugs is an abysmal failure. We're spending entirely too much money and resources on something that doesn't work. Look, we tried, tried prohibition, it didn't work, and created a whole new level of crime and black market crime that, that they wound up having to change and abolished that, from that, that uh, amendment because they realized it just wasn't working. Now, I don't think it's something we're going to be able to end overnight, but I think it's something we need to investigate and revisit, and at the very least, start decriminalizing some things. I, you know, I just really, and I, I realize I'm in a bar, I really don't see any difference between somebody taking a few hits off of a marijuana cigarette or getting drunk on whiskey. You're still impaired. You still had your mind altered somewhat, whether it's alcohol or something else doing it. I don't care what it is. If we're going to start putting people in jail for five and ten years at a time because they had a marijuana cigarette in their possession, but we're going to let a guy off a bottle of Jack Daniels go walk down the street, how does that make any sense to anybody? It doesn't to me, and, and you should know, I'm not going to pull Bill Clinton like, I did not inhale, I swear, I didn't try. <laughs> <laughs> I did not have sexual relations with that woman. <laughs> so I don't, I have never done illegal drugs. I have never had the desire to. Okay? I, and I'll look you in the face and tell you that I don't smoke cigarettes. I've never had the desire to, alright? It's just that's who I am. I know people who have, and I usually try not to hang around those people. That's just not something I do in my personal life. But the, the lives that we're destroying over something as, as innocuous as, as a marijuana cigarette in your possession, I'm not talking a big bag of stuff you're selling on the street. I'm just talking personal use stuff. We've got people serving prison time for that. <coughs> and I think it's time we revisit that subject with the idea of decriminalizing some of this stuff. And last was gay marriage. Now, I know these are issues we're hearing a lot about in the news lately, and frankly, these are things that I realize we have to talk about at some point. I do not see them as being the major issues that we need to deal with right now, because frankly, if we don't get the economy fixed and get it fixed soon, we'll be arguing about these things in the bread line. So we better get our priorities straight and start working on the economy first and foremost. Marriage, biologically, theologically, and traditionally, is a man and a woman. I do not like political correctness. I do not. I hate changing the language. 
Stop redefining the argument. That's what marriage is, a man and a woman. Now, having said that, if two adult males want to live together as a couple, as Jefferson said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, it neither breaks my leg nor picks my pocket. It doesn't hurt me in any way, shape, or form. I really don't care. You can call it a civil union. You can call it whatever name you choose. What two consenting adults do is their business. Okay? Now, if we get rid of the current tax code, it becomes a moot point. Number one, the government shouldn't be involved in who gets married and who doesn't anyway. At least I don't believe it should. I think that's for the church and for the communities to decide. So there's part of the problem right there. The government's involved. And I, when people say, well, the government should do X, Y, and Z, I would challenge you to tell me anything the government does well. Anything they do efficiently or anything they do that promotes their liberties. I would challenge you to tell me what it is. So I think we need to stop arguing about these per, what I call peripheral issues right now and decide what the big issue is that needs to be fixed. And that is a return to the Constitution and get our fiscal house in order. And once we get our fiscal house fixed and get the economy back on track, if we want to argue about these other things, yeah, let's argue about them. And we'll discuss whether it's a federal issue or a state issue. But again, when it comes to gay marriage, I just it's not an issue that bothers me that much except for changing the language. I don't want to change what the word marriage means. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you.